The next night I'd been back in the precinct less than two minutes when I was called into the captain's office. It was a brief meeting. Jason Hawking's transfer had been approved, as well as our new budget. Certain weapons, special ammunitions had been placed in the armory. My request for flamethrowers had been denied. I was also told, in no uncertain terms, that if the captain caught me firing silver-plated bullets downrange, he'd chew me a new asshole. The cost alone had almost given the police commissioner a heart attack. Still, we'd been given most of what we had requested, and I left the captain's office where little faith in the system restored. Jason Hawking had already moved in, his desk in the opposite corner to my own. Donna was also thankfully present, and I even managed to smile at her as I passed. Look at me, regular vampire ambassador of goodwill. I also noticed she had lost the blue contacts and fake tan. I guess she was through pretending for the sake of others. For some reason, it made me feel like I could trust her more. So, boss, Jason grinned at me. What's on for tonight? First, a trip to the armory to get your new sidearm. I turned to Donna. I see you took it upon yourself to add some new items to the list. She shrugged. Who knows the weakness of a vampire better than a vampire? I could hardly agree the point, although I was tempted, but after last night, I didn't want to cause any more waves for now. Come on, Jason. Let's get you suited up. Sure thing, boss, he grinned. I guess that makes you Robin? She Catwoman, then? He grinned at Donna. I could scratch you, she said, flashing Fang. And you could find out. Uh, that's okay. Jason said, hurrying out of the office. I followed on behind him, trying not to laugh. The armory and range were on sublevel one, just below the morgue. I suppose if you accidentally shot yourself, you wouldn't have to travel far. I gave up my badge and ID before being allowed into the metal cage. The squad now had its own section labeled Special Weapons, Authorized Personnel Only. Guessing that was us. From the armory, we took two modified Glock 22s with attached flashlight laser combos. The flashlight also had a setting for UV. Nice, Jason said, fiddling with the attachment. Thank Donna, I grunted. It was her idea. Grab a few mags while you're here, I said, nodding towards the shelf. The ones with the red bands are silver explosive tip. The blue band, regular old lead rounds. He did as he was bid, taking more of the former. From what Donna told me, he said, heading for the car, we we're going to see the Strigoi. She also told me that holy objects don't work on him. Is that true? Yeah, I said, as we headed for the parking garage. But they're actually more susceptible to silver. Oh, well, that's a relief, he said, hopping in the passenger side. Anything else I should know? Yeah, I grinned, pulling into the street. They're not yet covered by the Benson and Hodges law. Not fully, anyway. Donna tell you anything else about him? You two being so friendly and all? Is that a hint of jealousy, Carver? I told you before, I said, heading downtown. I don't do vamps. He ignored that. Yeah. She told me that the first Strigoi was a witch who rose from the dead, so... Although it's only a rumor, there could be some magic involved. Well, shit. I sighed. This night just keeps getting better and better. It was close to midnight when we arrived in the outskirts of the city. He actually heard the noise coming from the compound before we saw it. Jesus, Hawking said, winding down his windows. Sounds like one hell of a party. Freaks, I muttered, pulling off into a side road that overlooked a strange bricked building surrounded by a sea of multicolored tents. Heavy bass music surrounded us, and the smell of fried food, sweat, and sex filled the air. The hell is going on here? Hawking asked. Some sort of concert? I shook my head angrily. Freakers. Goddamn junkies. The bite of the Strigoi is said to bring on feelings of euphoria. Seems the word got out. Guess the Strigoi don't mind having a free blood supply just hanging around whenever they want it. Come on, I said, heading down the hill. Let's join the party. Slowly, we made our way down the embankment. Jason, cursing roundly as thorns and brambles raked at his trousers. I hate these fucking sticks, he complained. 
Why do they have to live right out here in the middle of nowhere? Because the vamps don't want them in the city, I replied, trying desperately to watch my footing. And until they get fully covered by the Benson and Hodges, looks like what the vamps say goes, so they live in the outskirts and bide their time. Well, they sure ain't short of company, he replied, coming to stand between me. So what now? We go in, all official-like, I said, taking my badge from under my shirt and letting it rest upon my neck. Hawking did the same. We're just going to have a look around, maybe ask a few questions. And if they don't want to cooperate, he replied, as we began to make our way through the many tents and revelers, I shrugged. You have no warrant, but we can always threaten them with one. You know, Carver, he said, shoving a drunken bearded man out of the way, who was dressed head to toe in PVC gear, studded crotch and all. You don't seem very concerned, considering we're walking into a nest of monsters with absolutely no fucking backup whatsoever. I shrugged, having to shout over the booing music. I ain't expecting any kind of trouble. The Strigoi want equal rights, or at least the same rights as their vampire cousins. Killing two cops? It ain't gonna do much for their cause. And you're gonna risk both of our lives on that weak-ass premise? I didn't reply. We were coming to the main building now. There I stopped and pounded on the thick metal door. There was no reply. Up there, Hawking said, pointing towards a CCTV camera that seemed to be trained on both of us. Turning, I flashed my badge and banged harder on the door. This time, there came a reply as a latch slid open and a pair of crimson eyes glared out at us. Detective Carver and Hawking, City of Midnight, Peter Natural Squad, open up. There came a guttural laugh. Get a warrant, policeman? Hell no, I laughed. But I could get one. Besides, I think you're breaking about 40 city ordinances with this BDSM sex party you got going on here. But we're not in the city, a thing rasped at me. That's right, you ain't. But this land still belongs to the city. It hasn't been developed yet, but it's still within their boundary. Thinking on it, probably in violation of fish, game, and wildlife, too. I could probably get you removed for violating some titmouse's natural habitat or some such. Believe me, I can find a way. So why don't you open up the door and we can all have a nice little chat and I'll leave you to whatever the hell this is. I said, opening my arms to encompass the leather-clad throng. The thing grunted and the latch was slammed firmly shut in my face. Well, that went well, Hawking sighed. Just give it a goddamn minute, will ya? I snapped at him. Moments later, there was a sound of rasping metal and the clank of opening locks and the door was slowly drawn open. My master has agreed to see you now, the Strigoi rasped, shutting the door firmly behind us. Follow, they commanded, leading the way through the dark corridors lit by single light bulbs that threw undulating shadows across the walls and floor. We turned a multitude of corners and walked down flights of slime-covered stone stairs, and I realized we were way below ground level. The concrete walls gave way to rough-hewn stone. The ceiling's cavernous and covered in dripping moss. The hell is this, Carver? Hawking whispered in my ear. Seems like some kind of cave system. I whispered back. Keep it together, Jason. We just gotta get to where we're going. Yeah, sure, he muttered. Just where the hell is that? As if answering his question, the Strigoi suddenly stopped before two large wooden doors, which he threw open, revealing a sort of primitive throne room within. Couldn't help but look around as we were thrust inside. The room wasn't natural, but had been carved out of the very stone. The chiseled walls were covered in ancient-looking tapestries, depicting the Strigoi in suits of armor on a battlefield, where they slaughtered both humans and vampires alike. I wondered if this ancient battle actually happened, or if it was just wishful thinking on Strigoi's part. Other scenes showed naked Strigoi women frolicking by a moonlit lake, bleeding victims hung upside down and gutted from a nearby tree. Upon a raised dais, sat in an ancient-looking chair, was one of the Strigoi. On his head he wore a crown made of gold, twisted and tortured into the shape of writhing human beings. Their elongated bodies wrapping around his bald, scabrous head. You know... I said, for someone wishing to join human society, that crown isn't doing you any favors. 
He looked at me then, long and hard before replying. A king needs his crown, Detective Carver, and in my own home I shall wear what I want. His voice was surprisingly cultured and seemed strange coming out of such a terrible visage. You know who I am, then, I replied. Who doesn't know the great Detective Carver? Scourge of vampire kind, the butcher of Brooklyn. Some would say it was foolish of you to come here alone. There's a rather large bounty on your head. But he ain't alone, Hawking said, stepping forward. The Strigoi ignored him. Tell me, Carver, whatever did you do to the master of New York to earn such a bounty? I realized then I didn't even know what my head was worth to this new master of New York, this mysterious Janos, or why he even wanted it. How much? I asked. What's my head worth these days? Two million dollars. You shot back. And you planning on collecting? I asked, hand slowly edging towards my gun. He snarled at me then. Do I look like a thrall to the vampires? I'm a king, not a servant. They've done nothing for my kind, and I owe them nothing. Glad to hear it. I let out a pent-up breath, dropping my hand down by my side. So, tell me, detective, why have you come to issue idle threats, or do you have some kind of business with me and mine? Straight to the point, very well. I've been told that Nicholas Tivington resides here with you. And who told you this? He asked, his bony brows crushing together. His brother told me, that's who. <laughs> yes, the vampire. And what do you want with our good friend Nicholas? So he is here then? Yes, he's here. He is my court seer. My eyes and ears against those who would stand against me. But tell me, detective, why should I grant you an interview with a person of such great importance? Because I'm asking. It's probably a bit blunt, but his superior attitude was starting to piss me off. Asking, he mused. In an official capacity, or more of a personal favor. He knew damn well I didn't have a warrant and couldn't force the issue. I had a feeling I was being pushed down a particular road I didn't want to walk. But if I wanted access to Tivington, it looked like I was going to have to play his game. For now, at least. I guess you could call it a favor. Although I could make it official real fast. He ignored that. And, wouldn't you say, he said, leaning eagerly forward, it a favor demands one in return. Okay, I sighed. What is it you want? Fuck this! Hawking barked from beside me, putting a heavy hand on my shoulder. Let's get the fuck out of here and come back with a warrant. We could even throw in a charge of obstruction. And when you come back with your warrant, the man you seek will be gone and you will have gained nothing. Take this one away, he said. And two more Strigoi emerged from the shadows, grabbing hold of Jason's arm. Get your fucking hands off me, he snarled. He snarled, starting to struggle. Jason, don't fight him. They won't harm you. They're not that stupid, are you? I said, glaring at their king. He'll not be harmed. Just take him back outside. He'll be quite safe while we finish up here. Go with him, Jason. Take your goddamn hands off him. The two guards looked to their king, who nodded at them. Instantly, they released Hawking. Damn right, he said, angrily straightening his cuffs. You sure you want to stay alone with these things? Sir Jason, you'll be fine, but if I ain't back in half an hour, call in the cavalry. You got it, boss. Okay, assholes. He turned to the two waiting Stragoy. Lead the way. A most unsavory character, that one, the king said from his throne. You know, I said after the doors had closed, you never told me your actual name. And I think you are distracting from the subject, he replied. But I know your name, 
and so it is only right that you know mine. My name is Caesar. <laughs> You're shitting me, I laughed. Like the Roman Emperor? Just so. But I believe we're talking about a favor for a favor. Yeah, I guess we... Guess we were, I said, shifting uncomfortably. So what is it you want? But know now I won't be breaking any laws on your behalf. Yes, laws. He smiled, a shark-like grin. Laws that protect some, but not others. You mean the Benson and Hodges law? I sighed, already knowing where this was going. I can't help you with that. I don't have that kind of power. No, he smirked. You're just a trained killer. But the master of the city does. And isn't it her that you're really working for? I don't work for her. I work for the city police department. She does have a hand in this. And you want me to approach her on your behalf? Makes you think she'll listen to me. Our last meeting didn't go so well. You're still alive, Carver. I would say you're doing very well. All I need from you is to deliver a message. Tell her this. The one she seeks is not amongst us, and that she should look towards the lowborn. Tell her if she wishes more information from us, she must stand with us when the time comes. Promise to tell her this, and you can have your interview with Nicholas. My head was reeling. What do you mean, the one she seeks? She never said anything about the succubus living amongst you. I blurted out, confused. He shook his head wearily. Succubus is not of what I speak. Tell her, Carver. She will understand. Yeah, but I don't understand. Who else could she be possibly looking for? I do not speak on the master's behalf. If she wants you to know something, she will tell you. Now, you will deliver my message, or no. Sure, I'll deliver it. I don't know what the hell you're talking about, but if it gets me an interview with Tivington, I'll tell her all the same. When it's a bargain, then a bargain has been struck. But know this, Carver. If you break your vow to me, you will suffer for it. I don't like being threatened, I growled. But Caesar merely sat back in his throne, his voice matter-of-fact. It's not a threat, Detective. Merely a truth. Now go, he said, pointing to another dark wooden door just off to his left. The man you seek is through there. Tell him I command him to assist you. I said nothing more. I knew a dismissal when I heard one. So I headed to the door and pushed my way through. Tivington lay in the middle of the room, surrounded by satin pillows. His shirt had been torn open, and a clearly female Strigoi was licking at his chest with her long, rough tongue. Her hand gently massaged his crotch. Not knowing quite what to do, I coughed loudly. The female Strigoi turned her head and hissed at me, but Tivington stroked her bald head gently and whispered something into one long, pointy ear. The thing smiled, stood, and walked past me. I felt a trickle of sweat run down my back. Yep. Very, very female. After the creature left, I closed the door firmly shut behind her. Tivington was fastening up the remains of his shirt. Quite the looker, isn't she? He tittered. Great, I replied. All you have to do is put a paper bag over her head. He frowned at that. Different strokes for different folks. I find Sasha most pleasing. Well, I said, I'm happy for you, Tivington, but I ain't here to compare the female anatomy with you. I need your help, and your king commanded that you give it. He tittered again and took a long pull from a nearby bottle, grimacing as the liquor burned down his throat. I'm here to serve at our king's command, he said, a little too loudly as if making sure his master overheard. How can I help you, Detective Carver? You know my name. Is it that psychic power of yours? <laughs> no, he laughed. I was listening at the door. 
Taking the claw from my pocket, I shook it onto the floor between us. What the hell is that thing? All this time among the monsters, you don't know what a claw looks like? <laughs> you want me to touch that? It's part of what you do, isn't it? That's how you see, I said, nudging it closer, but he scrambled away. <laughs> wait, wait a goddamn minute, Carver. You don't understand. I see what they see. I see what they feel. I feel what they feel. Ever been inside the mind of a monster, detective? He said, reaching for the bottle. But I snatched it away. It's enough of that crap for now. I want to know where this thing is hiding, the location of its lair, and why it's there, and what it wants. <laughs> no, no way. Then you better go and explain yourself to your king, I said, motioning towards the closed door. Sure, he'll be very understanding. Again, that nervous lick of the lips. With a trembling hand, he reached out before taking a deep breath and snatching up the claw. As soon as he did, it was as if he had been struck by lightning. His entire body went rigid, his twisted muscles standing out in stark relief, the eyes in his head rolling back, his mouth opening and closing like a stranded fish. A low whine issued from him, and his nose began to bleed. There was a part of me that wanted to shake him, to snap him out of it, but I didn't quite dare touch him. Still, I moved forward, meaning to do just that, but he let out a guttural cry and collapsed onto a sobbing heap, the curved claw falling from his bleeding palm. I tried to put a gentle hand on his shoulder, but he skittered away. Don't touch me! Don't you fucking touch me! Okay. Okay, no touching. What'd you see, Tivington? I have to know. What'd you see? <laughs> Images! He gasped. Blurred images, murder, uh, endless longing, loneliness. And where is it, Nicholas? What does it want? A mate. You shudder. All the victims were potential mates. They weren't strong enough, so they died. Sweet Jesus, they died with that thing on top of them. He shuddered. Why did it go after the master's human servant? I asked, hoping to have something to appease Livia in our next meeting. She was drawn to his power, like a moth to the flame, but it wasn't enough. Only the connection to his master kept him alive, and so, instead of finishing him off and ending his suffering, she left him as a warning to any who would stand in her way. Though well, she made one hell of a mistake. Livia wants her head on a silver platter. Now tell me, do you know where she is? Where's her lair? I don't know. It was all a great blur. A monster's mind so much more complex than a human's, but... I saw a, a bridge on the waterfront. She was flying a squirming man in her talons. You can actually fly. Just like the old mythology says. Yeah. He nodded. But it could take on the shape of a female, not... Not one, but many. She can read a man's desires, shape herself to the darkest secrets. I nodded. Great. Shape-shifting, flying nymphomaniac that could screw you to death. Can you tell me anything else? He looked me straight in the eye. Yeah. I can tell you something. Leave her alone, Carver. If you value your soul... Leave her alone. I found Jason waiting for me outside, the two Strigoi watching from nearby. As we made our way back to the car, they trailed us, the partying revelers fawning on them as they passed, stroking their arms, some even falling to their knees and openly weeping. Goddamn freaks, Jason murmured as we made our way up the hill. Act like they're fucking gods or something. They're monsters, Jason. Nothing more, I said, climbing back into the car and firing up the engine. He grunted in my direction, but his eyes... Looked troubled. So you saw Tivington then? Yeah, I saw him. What do you say? Not much. Thinks the succubus may be nesting somewhere nearby the riverfront. It's a big area to cover. Yeah, it is. And seeing we're so far the only two members of the squad, should take us just about forever. So, where to next? He asked as we headed back towards the bright lights of the city. You're going back to the station. 
I'm gonna write up a report and email it to the captain. And you? Unfortunately, I have to go see the master of the city, I said. Not mentioning that I was playing messenger boy for the Strigoi. Really? He said, end of excitement in his voice. I'd very much like to meet her. I hear she's very beautiful. Another time, perhaps. For now, I need to keep the captain in the loop. You can also fill in Donna. She may want to know what's going on. That seemed to mollify him somewhat. He may be married, but Donna was well, still Donna. I dropped him off outside the station house and headed for the Good Amour. Stepping out of the car, I tossed my keys to the valet and headed inside. The concierge, looking at his freshly clean rugs with concern, smiling my best PR grin, I walked up to the front desk. I'm here to see Livia. I'm sorry, sir, he smiled back. We don't have anyone here by that name. Look, I sighed. Let's cut the bullshit, okay? Just tell the master of the city that John Carver's here. She'll see me right away. He smiled again, called over one of his peons, and whispered in his ear. The man immediately grabbed up a phone and dialed the number, speaking softly before returning and whispering something in the concierge's ear. Very good, sir, he said, handing me a key card for the elevator. Please, David, he said to the younger man, show the gentleman to the elevators. No need, I said, turning away. I got it. As you wish, sir. Good evening. He said to my back as I could feel the waves of dislike emanating from him. As I stepped out of the elevator, I was greeted by a vamp I had never seen before. This one was dressed in casual attire, white shirt and jeans. He was tall with braided blonde hair. He also sported an impressive beard that had grown down to his massive barrel of a chest. He wasn't as powerful as Livia, but still I could feel his power pushing against me as he approached. Holding out a thick tattooed hand, I went to take that hand almost automatically, as well as the trained American men were taught to do. But instead, he grasped my forearm and squeezed it once, being careful not to harm me. Detective Carver, he grinned at me. No fangs on display, which meant they were retractable. Another sign of his age and power. Master's waiting for you. I noticed you didn't say your master, I said, following on behind him. It's because Livy is not my master. You could say I'm visiting from out of town. Really? And why would that be? He stopped and turned to me as if weighing my words. You could call me in the way of security. Little extra paid muscle. And why would the master of the city need more muscle? If Livia wants you to know this, I'm quite sure she'll tell you. Not for me to speak in her name. Scared of her, are you? He didn't seem to take any offense to this. As a matter of fact, yeah, I am. She pays well, that's enough for now. We were approaching the door as I'd seen before, the one with the strange markings. You have any idea what that means? I said, nodding towards the archaic symbols. I believe it's some sort of ancient Latin, he mused, but its meaning, I do not. Not one for asking questions, then? I don't get paid to ask questions, he replied, and I heard the first hint of annoyance in his voice. Maybe it was all the questions. Maybe he simply didn't like conversing with a lowly human. Knocking on the door, he spoke softly in a guttural language. A reply was given in the same language, and he opened the door and ushered me inside, closing the door slowly behind me. Livia was lying on a thick, luxurious rug by an open fire. She was dressed in a short black dress, showing off her long legs her ripe breasts pushing against the velvet-like fabric as she stared moodily into the fire. Detective Carver, I don't remember summoning you, and I don't appreciate spur-of-the-moment visits. Funny, I said, drawing closer. You always seem dressed for company. Did I take that as a compliment, Detective? She said, stretching seductively. Sure, why not? I have a message for you and some news on the case. Finally, she looked at me and stood, all elegance, and sat on the leather sofa, patting the seat beside her. I ignored that, but took a seat on the opposite side of the sofa, as far from her as I could possibly get. In an instant, she was on me, straddling my waist, pinning me in place. I felt the quick touch of her hand, and suddenly my firearm was flying across the room. You see, detective, she said, smiling down at me, as I tried to wiggle free. 
You can put all the distance you want between us, but you're never safe here. Get the fuck off me, I snarled. Are you sure? She said, grinding down on my waist. Your body's telling me something else. Get the fuck off me now! I yelled up at her. She laughed, and her fangs sprung into place. I could put you under now, Carver. Roll your mind and have my wicked way with you. But I don't go where I'm not invited. And just like that, she moved in a blur of motion, and in the blink of an eye, she was stood above me, my gun in her hand, which she offered me, but first. The next time I tell you to sit with me, you sit. I may not be so forgiving next time. I snatched the gun from her, my hand shaking, but not with fear. I was straining with all my might not to open up on her, knowing I would be signing my own death warrant. At last, I took a deep breath and holstered my weapon. Very good, detective. Now, sit. She sat, patting the seat beside her. This time, I did as she bid. After all, she had already shown me that she could disarm me at any time, and I didn't fancy another one of her fucked up power play lessons. So, she continued, not a hair out of place, you say you have a message and some news for me. I tried to get my whirling emotions back under control before answering. Yeah, I finally managed to answer. The message is from the Strigoi. At their name, she sprang to her feet, looked down at me, a mixture of disgust on her face and maybe something else. Hope. And what did the Strigoi have to say to you? Why did you go to see them? I explained to her all that happened, including my trip to New York and the pressing need to see Nicholas Tivington. Through all this, she listened carefully. And this is what they said to you exactly. That the one I seek is not among them, and that I should look amongst the lowborn. That's it, I answered. That, and if you wanted any more assistance, you must help them with the Benson and Hodges law when the time comes. You mind telling me what this all means and who it is you seem to be looking for? As a matter of fact, I do mind, she said stiffly as she walked away and sat in her wooden throne. Tell me, what more have you learned about this succubus plaguing my city? Not much. Actually, only that she's in the city looking for a mate and that she attacked your human servant because she was drawn to his power. That and she's nesting somewhere on the waterfront. And what do you intend to do about all this, John Carver? I guess we'll have to start by searching the waterfront. My squad's new and severely unmanned. That's where you come in. Oh, she said, raising one perfectly manicured eyebrow. How so? I want you to help. The waterside's huge. I need more manpower. That you can supply. Are you giving me orders now, John? No, I shrugged. Just requesting a little help in this joint venture of ours. And you shall have it. Though, I have men tied up in other places right now. That's why you're hiring outside help? Ah, uh, you mean Harold? Quite the specimen, isn't he? A great warrior. My women are almost falling over themselves to bet him, she said with almost disdain. Not your type, is he? I thought almost anyone was your type. I knew I was sailing dangerously close to the wind, but fuck her. This is the second time she had assaulted me and tried to prove her dominance. Anyone would think she considered me a threat. Then again, she could be just some sort of sexual sadist. To be honest, I could really draw a bead on her, and maybe that was the exact point. I had expected her to go into a fit of rage at my last comment, but she only smiled down at me. I've had many things in my long, long life, detective. I've been a whore for both peasants and kings. One does what one must to survive. But your insult has been noted, and we shall discuss it another time. For now, get yourself gone from this place. I'll send my men to searching the waterfront. Goodbye, detective. We'll be in touch. I said nothing but turned and left, only to be greeted by a bloody mess in the hallway. The vampire Livia had called Harold was slumped against the wall, 
his clothes shredded, his face a bloody pulp. Standing over him was a man dressed in a thirty-style suit. His hair greased back from his high forehead. He saw me and smiled, straightening his cuffs with bloody hands before marching right past me. Good evening, detective, he said as he passed by. He entered Livia's room without knocking and slammed the door closed firmly behind him. I continued down the corridor, giving the injured vampire a wide berth. He was out cold for now, but when he awoke, he would need fresh human blood to heal, and I didn't want to be around for that particular party. I only realized when I got back into my car how goddamn tired I was. Tomorrow was my day off, and I was glad for it. And I sure as shit could use the rest. Less than 45 minutes later, I was back in my apartment, the door firmly locked. I cooked myself a quick plate of spaghetti, which seemed to be the only still edible food in the place, and watched some crappy late night show before retiring to my bed. I didn't bother setting an alarm. Right now I needed sleep. I figured my body would wake me when I had enough. Get through another day. I awoke around midday, grabbed a shower and a bite to eat, before heading out. The city was a different place in the daytime. Not exactly dead quiet, but even by a small city standards, about 60% of the residents were of the undead variety, who were now safely tucked away in their beds. Most shops, restaurants, and boutiques were open. Most of them never closed. I mean, why would you with a 24-hour customer base? Still, it felt good to walk in the cold, crisp air and feel the winter sun on my face. I walked around a small local park for a little while before heading towards St. Anthony's, one of the only two churches in the city. The vamps hadn't wanted them there, but being part of America was living under the Constitution, and one of those rights was the freedom of religion. Still, they'd managed to get the number down to a meager two in their precious city. St. Anthony's was obviously a new build, but it did its best to hide it with its gothic arches, stained glass windows, and old-fashioned wooden pews. Stepping inside, I dipped a finger in the font, and made the sign of the cross before sitting in a nearby pew. It had taken me a long time to find God again, in hell. It had taken all of my courage just to step inside a church after I had gotten out of the hospital. I was scared, see. Scared that God would reject me, that he'd somehow see the tainted blood coursing through my veins, drive me out of his holy place. And... But he hadn't. Which begged the question, what was it that made a vampire evil? if not the blood. Perhaps a mark upon his soul, if they had one. Could it even be their actions, the murder and drinking of blood? And what about those like Donna, who had this evil forced upon them? Were they just as evil as the rest? And Livia claimed to love her human servant, or was it all about power and prolonging her life? Before I'd come to this God-cursed city, it had all been so simple. Good versus evil. Heaven versus hell. But now it seemed... Wherever I turned, there were deepening shades of gray. I don't know exactly how long I sat there, musing it all over in my head. But the sun had already set, and I turned to leave. Only to find Donna waiting for me at the bottom of the steps. Good evening, detective. She smiled up at me. Her cheeks were flushed, and she had obviously fed recently. The contacts were back in place, but her skin was the color of pale moonlight. Her deep red hair stood out in flaming contrast. She was wearing a tight-fitting blue dress, and I wondered if she even felt the cold at all anymore. What are you doing here, Donna? Shouldn't you be at the station? Just so happens, it's my day off, too. Although, we're both technically on full standby, should a call come in. Well, until we get more staff, that is. And we just so happened to bump into each other, I said, coming to stand beside her. No, not at all. I was tracking you. She frowned at her own choice of words. I mean, that is to say, I sought you out. I hate to tell you this, detective, but you have a distinct smell. All humans do. 
The older you get, and the more time you spend with a person, the easier they are to find. To be honest, I was beginning to feel a little paranoid. No more skipping that morning shower when Donna was about. She must have seen something in my expression, and she began to laugh. <laughs> Forgive me, detective, but it isn't a body odor, but more like a psychic signature. I suppose using the word smell is the only real way to explain it. So you're telling me that no matter where I go, you can now seek me out? Within reason, yeah. Well, that's fucking great, I huffed. I'm surprised you didn't already know this from your time in the squats. Guess they forgot to put it in the manual. Anyway, what could I do for you, Donna? I believe you invited me out for a drink, detective. I'm free now, and I'm willing to accept your offer. To be honest, I wasn't much in the mood for socializing, but... I had said some nasty stuff to her, and here she was, offering out an olive branch, which was damn big of her, for considering. Sure, we can go out for a drink. Like you said, I know nothing about you, and if we're going to be working together, it'd be good to run a background check. She smiled at that. Please don't do that, Donna, I asked her gently. Do what? She asked, confused. Hide your fangs while you smile. You are what you are. If we're working together, we're going to have to accept that. She frowned at that. How big of you, detective? And I knew I was close to putting my foot in it once again. I don't mean it like that, Donna. I just mean that I want you to be yourself, to be comfortable around me. She smiled uncertainly. Very well, detective. You may as well call me John, I smiled. In the name of comfort. If that's what you truly want, then I really don't mind removing these, she said, her fingers going to her eyes as she popped out the blue contacts. She sighed then. One of the many things I miss about being human detective. Uh, sorry. I mean, John. The color of my eyes. They were blue once, John. As blue and as deep as the ocean. Where are you from, Donna? I mean, originally. Where were you born? Let's find a place to sit first, she said. I know a little cafe just around the block from here. You could sit outside on a crisp winter's night, look up at the stars. No offense, Donna, but it's a little cold for stargazing tonight. No offense, but you have a warm jacket, and they serve the most wonderful warm-smelling teas. Ugh, okay, okay, I gave in. Lead the way. We walked side by side through the cold night air. Everywhere I turned, it seemed both men and even a few women were watching her with almost predatory gazes. It was only then that I realized just how truly beautiful she was and how elegant, as if seeing her for the first time through these strangers' eyes. Still, I had a strict set of rules when it came to the undead. It didn't matter if Donna was Helen of Troy herself reincarnated. I didn't fool around with the dead. Here we are, she said, smiling, coming to a stop outside of a little mock French cafe, fluttering, awning and all. We sat at a small round table, and when the waiter came, I ordered a hot lemon tea, Donna a cup of blackberry and kiwi for herself. When the waiter had left, I asked her why she bothered to place an order. I may not be able to drink it, John, but I can still enjoy the delicious aroma, she said sadly. I miss the little things like a good meal, smell the, the feel of the sun on my face. It's been so long I can no longer truly remember the joy of its touch. Instead, now I hide in fear, dreading the light of day. Our drinks came, and I drank a little, glad for its warmth, while Donna held her face above the steaming mug, breathing in the fragrance. After a little while, we began to speak again. You say that not everyone is given a choice, and again. That mean yours was taken away against your own free will? Yes. And no, she sighed. One can say that I courted disaster. You say, I fell in love with a vampire, John. I was born Donna Elizabeth Shrewberry in Cornwall, England, on the 16th of October, the year of our Lord, 1800. My father's name was Donald Shrewberry. 
a gentleman farmer. My mother, Mary Shrewberry. I had two younger sisters and one older brother named Matthew. We lived and farmed on the Morgan estate, the wealthy family of an aristocrat who owned most of the surrounding lands, villages, and farms. I had many tenants, ourselves included. I, myself, had been a sickly child and a late bloomer. Up until my seventeenth birthday, I'd been pale, sickly, tall, stick-thin, awkward in the limbs, and terribly shy. But when I did start to bloom, it had come on with frightening speed, as if nature had dropped the ball and was now desperate to catch up on itself. My skin seemed to clear up almost overnight, and my body began to fill out in seemingly all the right places. Well, I gathered it had been from all the glances I had suddenly received from the village boys when we went to town. I started to look after myself a little more, comb my long hair, wore more bright and frilly dresses. Around my 18th birthday, I was ready to join adult society, and it seemed only a couple of days after I had blown out my candles. The gentlemen suitors came a-calling, but I found none of them pleasing, and so politely refused their lavish attentions. My mother called me willful. My father had strong, but I wanted a man who I could fall in love with, who I could give my heart to. I didn't wish to marry for money, land, or position, but for love. Perhaps I was naive, but I was young and filled with life, and I wanted what I wanted, and soon I would... F I'd find it. Or at least I thought I would. Later that year, my family and I, along with many other landowners and tenants, were invited to a harvest ball that was to be held up at the old Morgan house. It was a fine mansion with soaring pillars, delicate stone arches. I spent days looking for a delicate blue dress that would set off my eyes, for I heard that Geoffrey Morgan had a particularly handsome son, and my sisters and myself were quite giddy with excitement to meet this handsome stranger who had just returned from his boarding school in faraway Oxford. Some night later, we were loaded up in our carriage and were on our way to the great ball, the air filled with gay laughter and the rustle of crepe and silk. We turned past the old gatehouse and we traveled down the winding road, marveling at the huge oak that lined the road like military guardsmen. I could already hear the sound of music and smell the scent of fruity wine and roasting food in the air, and my excitement grew as our carriage drew to a stop outside the magnificent house. Soon we were in the great hall, dancing and laughing, enjoying the festivities, when I felt a hand on my elbow. I turned to see a tall, handsome young man who bowed low to me and introduced himself as Anthony Morgan. So at last, I met the handsome young man who had returned and had been talk of the town for so long. And... Handsome he was, with his wicked green eyes and dashing white smile. He stayed by my side for the rest of the night, much to the envy of my two younger sisters, and perhaps every unmarried woman in the room. We danced and we talked and we drank, till at last he squirreled me into a dark corner and stole a kiss. I knew that it was wrong and there would be a scandal if we were seen, but still... I agreed to take a walk with him around the night-shrouded garden, unchaperoned. There were more kisses and hot fumblings until he tried to put his hand inside of my bodice, and that's when I breathlessly told him to stop, which he reluctantly did. I told him that my body was for my husband, and then he professed his love, telling me, although he had only just returned, he was leaving again soon for an extended trip to Europe see the works of the great masters, to visit Rome. But he promised, if I would want for him, he would return for my hand upon his return. Jesus, I interrupted her story, dragging her from the past. People sure did move fast back in those days. She smiled whimsically. It was a different time, John. People's years were fewer than lust could only be released in one's wedding bed, especially for the aristocracy. Do you find it surprising that he would lust after me? 
There was no arrogance in her voice. She seemed genuinely curious about my answer. So, I answered truthfully. No, Donna doesn't surprise me. She looked at me as if expecting more, but... When I gave her nothing, she continued. After that night, we saw one another often in the next few weeks. Before we went away, but never alone again, always with a chaperone. Anthony had made his attention towards me clear to both my father and his. Now the rules of proper and polite courtship were truly in place. Of course, you're probably wondering why Anthony didn't marry me right away and take me on his adventures with him to Europe. Well, the truth is, his father was less than pleased with the matching on our social ladder. The Morgan family stood head and shoulders above my own, and so his father insisted that any marriage must wait until his son's return. Perhaps, he thought, some time away from me would cool his son's spirit, or perhaps he'd find some noble countess or some rich heiress to bring back home. And so it was that my beloved set out on his journey. A journey that would take him almost a year to return from. Still, he left with my promise to wait for him, and many sweet, delicate words of love that he whispered in my ear. And just like that, he sailed away and was gone. <laughs> that year was the longest of my life. Although Anthony wrote me frequently, at least at first. The last letter I received from him, he described his excitement at entering the east and seeing the great woodland and forest of the Carpathian Mountains. And after that, I heard no more for four months. I received not a single letter until one cold, bleak winter's day. On an overcast, dreary November, I finally got what my heart had so longed for. A letter. It had only four words written within. I'm coming home. No confessions of love. No reason for his sudden silence, not even the date of his return. Just those four blunt words. Still, I was overjoyed at the thought of his return and quite convinced another letter would come soon with the finer details, but... It took another month until I saw my beloved again. It was well past midnight when a sharp rapping on my window woke me from my slumber, and there... There it was again. Same noise. Quickly wrapping myself in a dressing gown, I moved over to the window and looked out only to see my beloved in the yard, staring up at me and smiling. His eyes looked almost silver in the moonlight. Overjoyed, uh, I threw open the window, but he put his fingers upon his lips and bid me come down. In my excitement at seeing him, I quickly crept downstairs, wanting nothing but to be alone with him and to feel his hot kiss once again. Gently, I opened the door, careful not to wake anyone else in the house, and stepped out into the cold night air, but he wasn't there. He was up ahead on the boundaries of the property, heading towards the forest and the stream beyond. Anthony, I called out to him as he seemed to sigh, and it was as if he was all around me, yet nowhere to be seen. Anthony, please! Come to the river, my love, he called. And that's where I found him, his back to me, staring into the cold river's depth. His tailcoat was torn and there were leaves in his hair, but I didn't care. All I wanted was his embrace, and so I ran to him and I threw my arms around his back. But it was like embracing stone. And I could feel the cold emanating from him, even through his clothes. That was when I knew there was something terribly wrong. Suddenly afraid, I tried to pull back, but he turned on me, all hissing fangs and crimson eyes. I, I tried to scream, but his lips were already at my throat, gnawing at me, biting. He was strong. He was... He was so incredibly strong. I was getting weaker. My struggles less frantic until at last, I fell into a black hole of darkness. When I awoke, he was looming over me, smiling. Hello, my love, he laughed, together again at last. 
and now it will be for all time. He tore at my clothes while I was still in a weakened state and had his way with me, right there on the muddy riverbank. After that we stood. I was in a kind of daze and hungry. Never in my life had I been so hungry. Even his defilement of me seemed distant and far away compared to this terrible hunger. Taking my hand, he led me back towards my home. Come now, my love, you must feed for the long journey ahead. And God forgive my soul, I went with him. I massacred my whole family that night, John. My mother and my father, brother and two sisters, their screams and begging fell on deaf ears. Their faces were nothing more than that of any strangers so caught up in my relentless hunger and bloodlust. She was crying now. Great silent tears tinged with pink ran down her face. I wanted to go to her to wipe away those tears and tell her it's not her fault, but I... I couldn't. Or wouldn't. And so I said the only thing I could. I'm sorry, Donna. I'm so sorry. She smiled at me and wiped away her tears. Do you know, John, I can hardly remember their faces anymore. Except perhaps in my dreams. So, what happened next? I couldn't help but ask her. She shrugged. I stayed with him. I had no choice in the matter. He was my master. I his thrall. For a hundred and twenty years we traveled together. The man I fell in love with was gone, replaced by this uncaring master. But I had my revenge. I was cold to him, John, and never gave myself to him freely, not ever. Eventually I came to my own power, I broke the bond between us. I left him soon after and traveled to this new world, she said, gazing about. As for Antony, I never saw him again. Although I heard rumors, he had walked into the sun a few years ago. If so, good riddance to him, and I hope he's burning in hell. So, now we're even, John Carver. I know your story. You know mine. Come on, then, I said, finishing up my drink. Let me walk you home. She laughed. I'm afraid my home is way uptown, but I'll be happy to walk you to your boat. Mm, how could I refuse? I laughed. As soon as the words passed my lips, I regretted them. I didn't want to come across as all flirty here, did I? I mean, to be honest, Donna's story had twisted my way of thinking, or perhaps, perhaps that's why she told it to me in the first place, trying to prove all vamps weren't monsters. If that was so, she still had a long way to go. Still, I caught myself sneaking glances at her as we walked down the street. The smell of her exotic perfume lightly scenting the air. We were almost back in my place, just cutting through a nearby alleyway when an SUV with tinted windows mounted the sidewalk and came to a screeching halt, blocking the mouth of the entrance. Suddenly, an arm protruded out of the window. Attached to it was an MP5 submachine gun pointed directly in my face. I knew right then and there I was a dead man, but just as our unseen attacker pulled the trigger, Donna moved in a blur of motion, barreling me out of the way. The machine gun spat fire, peppering her body with hot lead, blowing massive open wounds out of her back, yet she never broke stride. Grabbing the man's arm, she tore it free with an explosion of blood, gristle, and bone. More firing was coming from the driver's seat. Donna reached inside and grabbed the now screaming man through the car window and hoisted him into the air. Her face a withering mass of demonic hate, before latching onto him and driving them both into the slushy, snow-filled street. The other car door shot open. A man emerged. He turned towards me, ignoring his dying partner, whose eyes had become steadily weaker as Donna drained him of his precious life's blood and raised his weapon. Quickly, I scrambled for my sidearm, drew down upon him. 
Just as he opened fire, his shots going wild, letting out a slow breath, I took steady aim and put two rounds into his face, dropping him like a felled tree. Donna was back on her feet now. Her lower face and chest covered with hot blood. She staggered away, a look of horror on her face. Donna, I said, climbing to my feet. She turned to me. Oh, John, what have I done? She said, looking at her own bloody hands in horror. Oh, dear God, they'll put me on a list, John. They'll, they'll call me a rogue vampire. The hell they will, I said, knowing exactly what list she was talking about. He was self-defense, Donna. He was trying to kill us. It doesn't matter, John. I fed on him. They'll say it was not consensual, that I could have... I could have just killed him. They'll say I have no self-control, that I'm a danger to society. Even if they don't lock me away for it, they'll have a black mark against my name. I'm... I'm finished, John. They'll kick me off the force. I won't be able to get a job, even working for that whore Bella. The crowd was starting to form now. I drew my badge. Call 911. Tell them officer in need of assistance. I ordered the nearest rubbernecker, who thankfully drew their phone and got right on it. Come on, Donna, I said gently, taking her arm and sitting her on the curb. She said nothing but just sat there, head down, her long red hair obscuring her face. One guy pulled out his phone and started to hedge nearer. Take a photo, I told him, and I'll break your head open. The phone disappeared fast, but I could already read the complaint he was going to file in his offended, haughty expression. Off in the distance, I could hear the sound of approaching sirens, wailing like banshees in the frostbitten night. I want to remind you guys that I also do narrations over at Chilling. The Chilling app is available for Android, iPhone, and if you'd like to get your hands on the Chilling app and hear myself as well as many, many other narrators, and they have a whole new setup where you can watch movies on there now, and it's also free to try out with ads now, so you don't have to get a subscription like you used to before. You can actually just get the app, you can start watching, you can start watching on your PC. It's evolved so much since the last time I have updated you guys on this, and sincerely, it's a great place if you want to see more horror, especially if you like horror audio. So strongly, strongly suggest you check out the Chilling app. And finally, I want to give a huge thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. So I want to give a very special thank you to Jordan Humble, Diana Kraus, Disciple, Strategy Wolf Emoji, Sully Man, Brandon Mendoza, Brimstone Pandemonium, Kaltuna, William Wellington, Scruffy the Janitor, Brenna Crow, Lakeda Canizales, Smiley the Psychotic, Jenna, Dante Kincaid, Simba's Bloody Mojo, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primark, M, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Verbal Horror, Amber Clark, Jay Kearns, Mike, Himbo Jerry, Crusader Chocobo, Gordon Dallas, Estebean, Seclude, Salty Surprise, Red Shadow Cat, Turtle Man, Cryolinian, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Dirt Diver 030, Voice of Sand, Psychomel, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Sashi Sazaku, Croconut 509, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Hades Nephew, Acid System, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. I really appreciate your support, and I cannot thank you enough. I wish you all the best. Sweet dreams.